Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this NCEA webinar presented in partnership with FACTS. Uh, we're going to get started in just a moment while people join the webinar. So feel free to let us know where you're watching from in the chat box. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to submit those in the Q&A. So we're happy you're with us. We have a good number of panelists with us today. So we're very grateful that they're taking the time uh, to collaborate and share their experience and resources with us. And just a couple of reminders. Um, there'll be an opportunity for certificates of attendance if you're interested uh, in that. So there'll be a uh, post-webinar survey shared with you um, during the webinar uh, as well as at the end. So we encourage you um, to fill that out. We appreciate your feedback and there'll be a certificate um, sent to you if you're interested as well. Uh, once again, feel free to um, let us know any comments or questions. Um, for comments, we encourage you to use the chat. And if there's a specific question you'd like to uh, you'd like us to address, we encourage you to use uh, the Q&A so we make sure that we see that. Um, our NCEA 2021 um, annual event is coming up next week, so we encourage you to uh, register for that. So you can head over to ncea.org, and we have uh, a couple of presenters um, with us today um, that will be joining us next week for NCEA 2021. Uh, so with that, um, let's begin with a short prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to collaborate um, and learn. We ask that you bless our panelists, our attendees, and bless this time we have together. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And now it's my pleasure to pass it off to Kelsey from FACTS. So thanks so much, Kelsey. Thank you, Jonathan. Can everyone hear me okay? We can. Great. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to discuss ways to engage your families and build strong school communities with use of mobile. Um, moving on. So to start, I'll be asking our panelists a series of questions. From there, we'll briefly touch on um, key features and benefits of the FACTS Family app, and then we'll wrap up with Q&A. My name is Kelsey Oldenkamp. I'm part of the business development team at FACS. Also joining me today is my colleague, Eldrin Ekternkamp, our director of technical sales. We at FACS are very honored to serve over 4,000 Catholic schools for tuition management, financial aid, and student information systems. So today we're going to share the next level in serving your schools and families. I'd like to give a huge thank you to our panelists for joining us for this session today. They'll offer us firsthand feedback on how they've handled the changing landscape of family and staff communication over the past several months, including the use of FACTS Family App as part of their overall effort. They'll also provide their thoughts on communication within their school communities and trends in technology. So let me turn it over to our panelists to introduce themselves and share a bit about their schools and dioceses. Nick, would you mind starting us off, please? Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nick Regina, the president at Melbourne Central Catholic High School here in Melbourne Central, Melbourne, Florida. Excuse me. Uh, this is my second year here. Uh, prior to this, I was in diocesan leadership in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia and the Diocese of Camden, which is just outside of Philadelphia in New Jersey. Um, before that, I spent uh, 20 plus years as a teacher and administrator at a Catholic high school. Good to be here with you. Thank you, Nick. Jennifer, would you mind going next? Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. I know your time is valuable and we appreciate um, you being a part of this. My name is Jennifer Treefelner. I'm the Director of Communications, Marketing and Social Media for the Diocese of Palm Beach. So I serve as the designated spokesperson for Bishop and also help to organize and orchestrate our media relations, public relations, develop uh, data-driven communications plans and also new marketing initiatives. I've been in this role for approximately three years. I say I earned my street cred by working at a Catholic high school for 15 years. So I was the director of institutional advancement there, handling our enrollment and advancement and fundraising, alumni relations, et cetera. And I had the pleasure of um, really starting our school off with our FACTS program from the beginning there. 
And then I also work for the Office of Catholic Schools doing some communications work for eight years. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here with you guys today. And um, thank you for having us. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Colleen, on to you. Hi, my name is Colleen Thompson. I am the Marketing and Media Coordinator for St. Gregory, the Great Catholic School in Virginia Beach. Uh, I've actually spent most of my life on that campus. Um, went to school there myself. My children go there now. I was an active member in the youth group growing up um, and married in the church as well. So I do basically the school social media yearbook website um, and then I'm a part of our advancement team as well, which is all of the uh, development, marketing, and um, giving to the school. I've been in that role about five years now. So thank you guys for having me. Thank you so much, Nick, Jennifer, and Colleen. Very much appreciate that, um, the introductions, and we're very happy to have you here. Um, so now that we're all acquainted, let's dive into the panelist discussions. So um, these questions will be for the three of you. Nick, we'll start with you. Before the pandemic, what was your school's primary, excuse me, I have to move that, your school's primary form of family communication and how has that changed over the course of the year? Yeah, well, I think that that's an easy question for us to answer. Our, our primary form of communication with our families was email, uh, which we still continue to do uh, but we recognized uh, and we continue to recognize that I think pandemic or not, uh, we had to think of a different way because uh, not everybody's reading email these days and you never know where the email is going to land. Uh, so we knew we had to begin to think differently about that. Uh, think uh, differently about the timeliness of the communication, the immediacy, the proximity of the communication that we did. Uh, and one of the reasons we gravitated toward the Fax Family app and and toward using uh, another benefit of the, the fax SIS, which is being able to text families information. So we've kind of shifted from, yeah, we sent an email to, we did these three things to make sure families got information. Yeah, I think that's pretty common. Email has always been, um, you know, a main way to reach families. And then of course, I, the fact that you guys are using the student information system. So appreciate that feedback, thank you. Um, Jennifer, how would you respond from the diocesan point of view? Sure. So we have 18 schools in five counties. And I would say, um, you know, if you've seen one Catholic school, you've seen one Catholic school. So each school is a little bit different in how they were communicating. They use a myriad of different tools, especially prior to the pandemic. Everything from sending home notes in the backpacks, you have a weekly folder that goes home. Um, to, you know, messaging through RenWeb um, and school events was a big one too and conferences. So once the pandemic began, you know, in the past 12 months, we really realized the value of electronic communications and being able to arm our families with clear, transparent communication um, and having that done through, you know, apps and social media website announcements, et cetera, and try to cut through the noise that they're getting on a constant day-to-day -day basis. Um, so kind of seeing that shift um, from more of the face-to-face -to, -face to making sure that you have this robust um, program, kind of an umbrella approach um, so that people can start learning and gleaning more information from those electronic tools. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, you know, I think we, we see that a lot where each school kind of operates in their, their own ways. Hopefully this will kind of create more of that um, unified approach through technology. Thank you. Uh, and Colleen, what would you have to add for that question? So when I first started in my position, there was a lot of um, chatter from parents as to how communication was ineffective in our school. Um, and it was either too much or it was not enough or it was one teacher said this, but another teacher said that. So there wasn't enough clarity in what was being said. Um, so social media became a huge part of how we were communicating with our parents. And it was a, an age difference thing. You know, a lot of our parents are, that are older are leaving the school and their kids are going on to high school. And a lot of the parents that are coming up, especially because we have kids that go from junior kindergarten all the way to eighth grade, those parents for the most part are much younger. 
and they have a much different methodology and how they get their information. So they don't want papers coming in and out. They're just gonna throw them away. You can send them things in the mail and they're just gonna throw it away. But if you do an app alert or if you do texting, if you do emails here and there or an email blast or you know some kind of social media campaign, those are the information that, they're, that they want to get. That way, just short, quick, immediate gratification. They don't want stuff that's gonna take a long time. So we've really utilized the, um, the app pushes that we can do and that we get a lot of response immediately from that, especially if it's a last minute notification or reminder for something that's coming up. Um, and then with this app, again, with the instant gratification, they wanna be able to access all of their students' information or the school directory, emails, all of that information easily without having to go to another platform to find it. So having the app right there that they can just, and it mirrors RenWeb perfectly, has been a huge blessing in that respect. That's great. Um, you know, I, I completely agree with you. It seems that especially now families are expecting to have more of that technology-based communication component. So uh, I love your use of the app notifications mm -hmm. to assist with that. Thank you. All right, so now we're gonna move on to question number two. Um, we'll come back to Nick. What trends are you seeing in your family's communication preferences throughout the student family life cycle? Um, and this could be anywhere from inquiry through graduation from your school. Yeah, I, I think um, in terms of a trend in family communication and preference, it is proximate and immediate. And so families are looking more for getting information quickly and being able to digest that information very quickly, whether it's you know, starting with, with uh, going to our website, uh, we're a high school, so somebody's interested in ninth grade, going to the website and filling out an inquiry form, filling out a request for a tour, filling out something simple where it's a kind of a one-stop shop, one click, and it really begins there. And we've kind of tried to begin to embrace that thinking in everything we do here at the school in the course of the year. Um, you know, we our life cycle cycle shorter than Colleen's. You know, you you guys are, are looking for the, that, that gang to stay there for 11 years. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're happy when it's four. Uh, so we got to keep them here for, you know, uh, for the four years. But I think it really is about being timely and being proximate and making it easy for families to access us. And so our thinking has turned to, how do we make this easier for our families to make sure that from start to graduation and after, because we want families to stay with us after the kids graduate. How do we keep them engaged? We think it's timely and proximate communication. Yeah, I really like that feedback um, and the dynamic, the difference between the, the age levels that um, your school and Colleen's school are seeing. Um, but I think it's, like you said, it's important to meet those families in the moment and provide them with that information that they need quickly and efficiently. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, what are you noticing? Sure, so I, um, to echo what Colleen said and kind of dive into that a little bit further, what I'm noticing here at a diocesan level are those trends that are differing from generation to generation. And what she was speaking about are those parents that are Gen X, for example, they're born between um, 65 and 79 um, years old. And I, I think research has shown how they would like to obtain the information um, and, and those families would typically have high school students. So they're using a computer more than those who are millennials um, who are you know, between 27 um, and 41 years old. And so that group of millennials definitely, you know, with the younger counterpart wanting, um, you know, texting and um, utilizing that app. You know, I think that research has shown that regardless of that generational trend or that shift, um, you know, both of those dynamics are still using apps um, and that they want that clear, transparent, concise information. And one thing that, you know, we all have in common across the United States is the fact that we are competing with a lot of other noise and a lot of information that's coming at these parents and these families and students about, you know, changes in policy and, the school year calendar has changed and you know, now we're going to in-person learning or at-home learning. So I think being able to um, clearly communicate with them 
um, I think is really helpful. We have done, uh, when I worked at the high school, a survey to understand really how they're obtaining information, how they're absorbing it. And it might be a good time for our schools to do that once again, so we can understand it at this point in time, you know, how they would prefer to receive that communication. I think we're gonna see a lot more of that um, social media, having an app, having, you know, a real strong digital presence um, would, would definitely rank higher there. I, yeah, I agree with you. I love that idea that you guys survey the families to, you know, to hear what they want um, and then use that for effective communication. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Colleen, at your school, what communication trends have you been noticing? So if you go back to just last spring, um, one thing that was same across the board, probably not just at our school, was an over inundation of information within the first two weeks of virtual learning. And what my takeaway from that was when we got back this year, because we've been in person since August, was that everything has to be just the nuts and bolts of what needs to be communicated, no extra information. And it all needs to be the same across every single platform. So when the parents you know, get a paper calendar that's in print and then X, Y, and Z changes, they throw a fit because everything's not the same as it was when they got the print calendar. So we've shifted a lot of that stuff to all digital based. So we have a Google calendar that's password protected, but shared with all of the parents so that it's live updated and they can subscribe to it so they can get notifications, they can add it to their own calendar, uh, but very concise and majority of it digital communication has been what they have been desiring. And it's also impacted our middle school students who are now starting to have their own phone, they have their own Instagram. So they get excited that they can log in through their parents' um, login information, but they have the app on their phone. So they have, my 12 year old son is, loves it. He can just go online, he can see his homework, he can see his grades, but it puts that personal accountability on him. So he's constantly saying, oh, look, Ms. So-and-so posted my test and I got a 95, I'm so excited. So that instant gratification is carrying over to the kids as well. And then we link to our social media platforms through it so they can go on and they can keep up to date with everything that's posted on there or find themselves in pictures, which they absolutely adore. And, you know, it just kind of brought more of a family feel back together just because of that one component. Yeah, I, I like what you said where you kind of you all have to hold accountability. So whether that be the students, um, the parents, teachers, whomever, and the ability to be able to provide that instant gratification through automatic updates um, mm -hmm. is certainly key and invaluable. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, great feedback from you guys on those questions. Um, now we're gonna move along. Uh, we'll head into round one of our questions. These will be specific to each panelist. Um, so, Nick, we'll start with you. As president of Melbourne Central Catholic, how have you positioned your school as a technology leader? Well, you know, I think, first of all, it, I have to go back to the, folk, the folks who preceded me here because they began to business in the school as a leader in technology with something as simple as a one-to-one -one Chromebook program that started here, I think, now three or four years ago. Uh, so every student gets a Chromebook, so uh, we've moved away from backpacks with 50 pounds worth of books in them. Uh, that begins to, you know, help a school uh, be positioned as a school that embraces technology. Uh, we have added a, a facility here, we call it the Dream Lab, which is a tech center. That helps. Uh, the communication, whether it's via an email or whether it's via the app now or through the student information system, or through an embracing of social media, I think also positions us as schools, as technology leaders. And I'll echo with um, a little bit of what Colleen said and, and what Jennifer said, understanding who our audience is, who our customer is, is one of those vital things. Uh, so here at, you know, at Melbourne Central Catholic, we know we got a bunch of Gen Xers as parents. Apologies to you Gen Xers in the audience. Um, but we also know that very soon we're gonna have a millennial parent here. And so we, we have to kind of straddle both um, ways of getting information to people or, or different ways of getting information to people. 
but I think positioning ourselves as a technology leader is just being at the forefront of what has become an expectation, which is we are going to use technology. Uh, we're going to have it and we're going to use it and we're going to communicate how we use it. Because it's one thing to say you have it. It's a completely other thing to say we have it and this is how we use it. Great. Yep. Use those resources. Um, yeah, I I completely agree with you. Um, that tech center is is very interesting. Um, is that something that's available? I know this isn't part of the question, but is that something that's um, just available to your students, like as a lab to go to, or or what? How does that work? Well, it's kind of a both end. So it's it's become part of the curriculum now. So for example, our our coding class uses the three D. We have a room of three D printers, and they use those three D printers. They have to code to create an object as simple as a spinning top. So it starts at the basic level and then they get a finished product. So it's becoming part of the curriculum. And then we have another room that's a, a virtual reality room that the kids, not necessarily part of a class, but they can use it on their unscheduled time, uh, monitored, of course, uh, mm -hmm. for that. We have a broadcast studio, which is part of a course. Um, so the building has opened up the program, our ability to to make it hands-on. That's that notion that you can say you, you you have technology, but how are you using it? You gotta make sure you use it. Yes, yes. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so then we'll move on to Jennifer. Um, across the diocese, what challenges do you what challenges do you see schools facing when communicating with families? Yeah, that's a great um, question. I think our schools have faced a lot of unique challenges um, when communicating. You know, we've talked about a few of them, one being um, that, that our schools are really trying to be heard above the noise um, and all that distraction that our families are getting. I think a second would be um, that there are a lot of changes. So, um, you know, a year ago when we were transitioning to at-home learning and then um, we had new CDC guidelines and um, part of my job too is communicating information about the parishes. And so as we're talking about the parishes that also have schools um, that are connected to them, what does that look like? Um, and a part of it too is people are very opinionated right now about how they feel. And so a lot of our school administrators are not only having to share what these policies are and communicating, but then they're also really busy fielding complaints. Um, so, you know, we really tried as, um, you know, we have a really strong office of Catholic schools and a strong diocesan presence. And so being able to roll out the communications from office of Catholic schools level and a diocesan level. So, you know, trying to make sure our school administrators knew that we had their back they had tough questions, they could call on us and we could help them, um, you know, providing templates so that they had the materials that they could use that language. So we're gonna, you know, script the language for them and they could use that. Um, because if each of our different schools is, you know, interpreting the rules differently or using different language, it's a lot harder um, because we do have families with kids in multiple schools and you know it's a small world so people are talking from school to school um, so being able to provide those templates um, also using like a multimedia approach so sometimes in an email or text things could be you know misconstrued on occasion so we've been using a lot of video messages um, from our bishop um, really explaining what those protocols are you know verbally or you're seeing someone um, I think that's been a, a very big um, help. Um, and also for our schools that already had robust social media systems in place, they had social media administrator agreements, they had a really good e-newsletter system, they already had an app for their school in place. They were already ahead of the game when it was time to roll out this content. So kind of playing catch up with some of those schools that maybe didn't have that. Um, and good contact information for their families. So having that good school information system presence um, was really important so that it, you know they could communicate with everything right there at their fingertips. So um, we did provide templates in advance too for most crisis you know, communications um, information. And then you can kind of dovetail that to how you're gonna message things that pertain to COVID and this past year. 
That's very helpful. Um, I think that's great that you're able to kind of streamline that communication for your schools and then therefore the families. So they're all getting that same message kind of in the same way. Um, and then through technology, um, you know, able to get that very quickly. And as you all have expressed, if there's any changes, um, they get those updated changes right away. So great, great responses there. Um, we'll move on to Colleen's question. As marketing and media coordinator at your school, what are the most important things that you communicate with families and how do you get them to engage? So pretty much anything outside of the classroom falls on me to communicate. Um, teachers have their own individual ways that they handle their communications within the classroom. 90% of it is done through Google Classroom. Um, we, put our, we tried to streamline everybody this year and put them all in a Google Classroom so that if we were to go virtual again, it would be easy as a pick up your Chromebook and go home and everything stays the same. Um, your class schedule would stay the same. Your assignment, the way you submit everything. So especially for middle school, it would be an easy transition. So in for, terms of any kind of communication outside of that, I've had to just kind of adjust how we get the information to them. And in a nice way of saying it, dumb it down. <laughs> um, you know, when you have new, we had an influx of new families this year because people just wanted their kids in school and out of the house. So we had a ton of new families who were not familiar with any of our procedures um, in terms of, you know, dropping off your student or picking up your student and just normal protocols that we follow on a daily basis. So what we did was, what I did was basically redo the entire website and we made it much more user-friendly, much more easy to follow. Um, and then I also made instructional videos of using um, aerial shots of the campus and animations to show people how the cars are supposed to line up every morning, how you're supposed to pull in with, you know, verbatim next to it, but illustrations to show you how all of that was supposed to happen. Um, and then anytime we've had any kind of group gathering, it's been virtual. So when we did our raffle pep rally this year, I had to make a virtual pep rally. So everything has kind of been this digital video format that we're still trying to make these personal connections with people, but you know, it, in, a, in a COVID way. So it's been challenging, but um, they've been really well received. And I think people having the, you know, somebody just take the time, when you get your Chromebook home, these are the steps you're gonna follow. This is what it's going to look like. And you add a little bit of music and a little bit of spunk to it and they get excited and it's new and it's kitschy and it's, you know, something different. So instead of just trying to follow paper after paper and not, you know, your screen's not matching what's printed on here because it's different. So if you have this, you know, somebody taking the time, I think, to just show you verbally and digitally, it's, it's been really well received. That's, I, I love your examples. Um, I think a lot of schools are in the same boat where everyone just kind of had to pivot and, and find ways to effectively communicate um, and streamline those processes. So to be able to take all of those resources, those tools and have it um, easily accessible for families in one location as the changes are made uh, is very beneficial. Thank you. Uh, okay, so now we're going to move into round two of the questions, again, specific to each panelist. Um, Nick, we'll loop back to you to begin. Um, what communication strategies produce the most family involvement at your school? I think we're seeing a little bit of a change in this. Uh, and the, the strategies that are producing the most involvement is social media, uh, more Instagram now, not that Facebook, Facebook is still a popular social media venue, but Instagram is starting to become more popular. Uh, and then also the texting that we've begun to do out of the student information system. Uh, then kind of catching up quickly is the push notifications through the app uh, that we've you know, been using more and more as the year has progressed here. Uh, that's what in terms of vehicles, but I would also say in terms of strategy, thinking about the consistency of communication and not over communicating, but I know this is so general and vague, not over communicating or under communicating. What's, what's the exact right kind of flow that you want families to get? We've kind of uh, 
settled into a nice kind of rhythm here with one week we're sending a, an electronic newsletter home and the next week is a, an email from me and the president from the president on the president me and the principal uh, but bullet points not a not a long letter but maybe two three or four bullet points of updates that are going on at the school we've seen that strategy become a very effective one for our families for covid information, yes, but also for just things going on around the school. And recognizing that just because we sent an electronic newsletter home last week, what was in that may not have been, everybody didn't read that. So we may repeat one or two things from that in a short bullet point. Uh, so we've seen kind of the, the process and flow and timing of communication and thinking about those strategies be very effective for us. Wonderful. So testing and using what's shown uh, or proven to work for you guys. And I like that you're using kind of the multiple avenues maybe to communicate that same information um, while keeping it very um, straightforward for the families. That sounds great. All right, now we'll move into Jennifer's question. As Director of Communication and Marketing for the Diocese, what resources do you use to stay on top of communication trends? Um, good question. So I've been utilizing a lot of NCEA has um, some really good podcasts and webinars um, that they have been rolling out. And I always try to stay plugged in with those and understand, um, you know, what the state of, you know, the updates are for each, you know, one of the entities that they have webinars such as this and learning from each other. So we're not reinventing the wheel. I'm also a member of the Public Relations Society of America and our Florida Public Relations Association. So I do as much of that professional development as I can to understand what's coming down the pipeline, what tools and resources there are, um, you know, which apps and video tools um, we can utilize. We have quarterly parish communication strategy meetings that I host with all our parishes and our superintendent organizes um, Zoom meetings for all our school administrators. And those calls are good for us because we're learning from one another. So somebody may have figured out, you know, a new, you know, easier way to do an Instagram story and they're gonna share that with us. Um, and then we're gonna be able to um, push that information out. So kind of monitoring to see what other organizations and schools, we have a lot of bright people um, that are working on solving problems and learning from one another. I think being open um, to understanding what those trends are and how you can best use them is really important. Um, so whether it's going to be from your school administrators and meeting with them um, to, you know, we kind of have an open door policy where our schools will email me all the time and say, you know, do you have, how do you solve this problem or can you help here or I'll meet with a vendor and then, you know, send information to our school administrators and say, is this something that you'd be interested in participating in? Um, so I think not only learning from one another, but also looking at some of those industry standards and then to what NCEA has to offer. Those are great resources. I like that, um, you know, learning from each other. That's definitely important. Um, just asking each other questions, why reinvent the wheel, as you said, if those yeah. resources and tools are already there. Thank you. All right, um, question for Colleen now. Which features have you found to be the most beneficial for families to access from family apps? Um, so I would say the fact that it mirrors RunWeb perfectly has been a huge, huge asset. Um, you know, our parents, most of them have an average of four kids in each family. Um, and they are, you know, once school ends, it's activity, 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 activity. So I can tell you from my own personal experience, homework is done in the car quite frequently and being able to pull up the app and just access everybody's homework right then and there, um, you know, or talk about the grades that are coming through or anything like that has been extremely helpful. Um, we don't have cafeteria service this year, but I know in the future when we are able to post a, um, a calendar of menu items every day will be extremely helpful, especially if parents need to place, you know, lunch order or put money in because they forgot to last night. Now they can just do it over their phone. That will be hugely beneficial. Um, and then just the, the app pushes have been huge this year. It's just, you know, we figured out part of all of our jobs is having a pulse on 
the heartbeat of our community and having the ability to see where the trends are when you're actually on your phone doing something. So one of the benefits of being an alumni and a parent at the school while I work there is that I know everybody. So we're all friends on Facebook and I can monitor you know, what they're saying if they're complaining about something and then I can take that back and how can I fix that with, you know, with what I do. Um, we also have a parent group that I'm a member of that I can monitor and I can see, you know, if there's a huge group in a certain grade level that's having an issue then I can go back to the school and be like, hey, sixth grade teachers, there was a bunch of chatter about XYZ last night, handle it how you want to, but I want you to have that information. And then they, I've had, you know, several teachers come to me later that was so much better than, you know, it didn't blow up in our faces, we were able to nip it in the bud or, you know, stuff like that. So just having that ability to have it all right there on the app is just, and I don't have to go searching for anything. It's just, it's huge. And I've had so many parents that are just thrilled with the ease of access and I can time things, I can schedule them. So I can, you know, send an app alert six o'clock tonight or three o'clock, you know, when I know they're physically on their phones. And I think that's been a huge part of it is it doesn't get missed like that. Yes, thank you very much. Again, kind of going back to that whole instant gratification that you've all, again, mm -hmm. communicated, having it right there for you um, whenever you need it, whatever you need to access, um, and really just keeping everyone in the know. Um, and I, I like that uh, scheduling things to, uh, to go out or mm -hmm. uh, notifications to be pushed out as well. Thank you very much. All right, so this now takes us into round three of questions. Um, so in our order again, we'll start with Nick. How does your school utilize FACS Family App and how has it been received by families? Well, I'll echo Colleen a little bit because I think um, we use it for anything that is in FACS slash Renwell. And its look and feel and content is excellent because families have access to the school calendar, they have access to grades, they have access to homework. Uh, that's how it's being used. Uh, mostly it's, it's, it's like having Fax Red Web at your fingertips without going to a keyboard to get it. Uh, has it been, how has it been received? Very well by families. We've seen as the years progress, more and more families begin to download the app and use it. Uh, we are probably uh, trending along to about half of our families with it right now. But that's saying something for a high school. I will say that to you. It takes a little bit of time and communication um, for our generation of parents, but it's growing because people are happy with it. And much like when we talk about enrollment, what's the most effective form of marketing we can do? Word of mouth. Uh, I think the most effective form of uh, getting people in to know about the family app is word of mouth. So the more people use it, the more they're enjoying it, the more people are joining. Wonderful. I'm glad to hear that um, it's trending in a positive direction for your school. And, um, you know, it, it is also um, interesting and important to keep in mind how it might look from, say, Colleen's the junior kindergarten through eighth grade, and then the high school aspect as well, and how um, it would be received and used in those settings. So thank you. Yeah. We're ready for these millennials when they get here. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> get them to use it. Okay. Um, Jennifer, to you now, um, how do you advise schools to improve their communication technology solutions with small budgets? Um, sure. And a lot of our schools do have small budgets when it comes to this. So, um, a few different ideas. Number one would be to utilize the virality of social media. Um, and if they have a social media administrator, and actually I see in the audience that we have today, um, some members of some of our schools, and there is one gal um, that's listening that does a phenomenal job um, with social media um, for their school. Um, and really being able to have sites that are relational um, where you're checking the analytics often, you're seeing what is working, what's not, um, and having a strong social media plan based on your marketing pillars. So I think that's one thing you can do on a smaller budget. Another thing um, would be to utilize social media ambassadors or parent ambassadors. So, you know, people respond to people. And if, you know, Nick just mentioned, you know, the word of mouth, being able to have that authentic endorsement 
from parent to parent um, and being able to explain the value of that purchase decision by investing in their Catholic school and, and what is the value of that. Um, so being able to have those social media ambassadors and those parent ambassadors that are communicating the value of the school um, and really any large um, initiatives that you wanna roll out. Um, and thirdly, I think too, having that umbrella approach that we've spoken about um, with the app or the website, um, I know that um, for our family, I, uh, we don't have phones at the dinner table with the exception that um, I use looking at my daughter's homework on the app um, as a conversation starter and to make sure she did it, but also to say, you know, because some of these students, especially teenagers, they're, they're not real chatty about what's going on for the day. So if you're able to say, you know, Olivia, tell me a little bit about this science project, or, you know, I'm not sure you should really be FaceTiming your friends after dinner because you have this test coming up, and then that is going to spark a conversation. So I think being able to have at your fingertips um, just conversation starters that you can use at dinner time, or like Colleen said in the car, that's another great example as a mom driving kids around, you know, of, of how that is in reality. Um, and, you know, Olivia also has the app on, you know, on her phone so she can understand, you know, what her homework is as well if I'm not home and I'm at work uh, and she's at home. So just a few different things there that you could do on a smaller budget um, that I think would be valuable. You can get, you know, a lot of bang for your buck, I think, with implementing a few small initiatives such as that. Wonderful feedback. Um, I completely agree with you. Social media is very widespread, something that's available to just about everyone. So that's a great tool. And I love the the transparency component with, with your children, um, being able to have the same access to what they do. So there shouldn't be any surprises, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you. All right, um, on to Colleen's question. What was your favorite part of the app setup and design process? Um, so I, when I first was asked to take it on, um, the only thing that was daunting was, oh my God, I have to create this thing. <laughs> but as an art major, my creative wheel started going and then I had to make myself stop on a daily basis because I was having too much fun doing it. Um, but I did like that, you know, you, you can do the easy way where you just, you know, through a library of icons and, you know, that, you know, just kind of the generic version of it. Um, but I really liked the fact that I could go into a design software and I could brand it to the school and I knew exactly what features our parents were looking for. So I could make it very personal for them. So I went in and I just designed a whole bunch of different logos and then I got to play with adding links and I got to, you know, play with different colors and decide if I wanted a color scheme and if I wanted it to be more little kid or did I want it to be more adult. So, and then, you know, I fully plan on revamping it for next year because it's fresh and it's new then and it's not the same thing every year. So you've got a new group of kids, a new group of parents and you want to kind of keep it different every year and not the same thing and it just gets stale. So I really like the fact that I can personalize it to the school completely. Yeah, that's, um, I think that's also one of my favorite things. And you guys will show examples of Nick and Colleen's apps that they created. Um, but that's one of the key benefits is it is extremely tailored. It's a customized school app for your school. So different from each school. Um, no app will probably look exactly alike. Um, and again, tailored to meet the needs of your families. So using what we have available to you as resources for images, uh, or if you do have more of that artistic flair to, um, to create that as you're able and as you would like as well. So great, great responses, you guys. Um, thank you again for that feedback and for sharing how you're using technology to improve communication within your school communities. Uh, now, before we get to our audience questions, I do want to hand the mic over to Eldrin to spend just a few minutes showcasing benefits of Fax Family App. Uh, so Eldrin, go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Kelsey. Yeah, so we've talked quite a bit about the Family App uh, in uh, the discussions we've had today. So I just want to give a couple 
couple of high uh, keys to it. We've, we've mentioned it numerous times, the idea of a school branded app. Um, it kind of takes away from downloading something that's generic um, that uh, everyone has that you can spe specifically tie in those key things for your school. Uh, Colleen talked about being able to to really you know bring out what they want to highlight, uh, make it your own. And of course, we've talked about integrating with the different facts products from grade books to attendance, um, also the financial side, uh, tuition payments, incidental billing, things of, uh, of those nature, and, and also. We like that we've templated it out so you don't have to know design. You don't need to know code. Uh, any adjustments, changes that you want to make to your app, you can do on your own side. Uh, and it's real time. So you're not waiting for, for uh, a developer uh, in a sense. Um, I'm going to pick on Colleen again. I loved her uh, idea or notion of using aerial photos to show the, the drop off and the pick off. Um, I could have used that at my school. I think they finally just let me do my own thing because I got tired of trying to get me to, to figure it out. So I like I like pictures. So I just wanted to grab a couple of shots off of my phone just to kind of give you a feel for those different pieces. We've talked about grades, homework, attendance, calendars, being able to see what's coming and, and having more than one calendar. Maybe you have from the student information system, you also have a, a Google calendar. You can bring those together. Lunch ordering was something that we mentioned as well, being able to make payments. We also have with the facts giving, allowing folks to, uh, if you're running campaigns or appeals, they can access all of those different pieces uh, simply from, from the app. So to highlight Nick and Colleen, uh, we, we grabbed some screenshots of theirs. Uh, and again, that idea of Colleen's on the right, being able to customize those, those individual icons. Um, just the, the whole feel of, you know, this is the same app, but how they can look completely different uh, based on um, kind of how you want your app to look. So kind of in closing, I'll turn it back over to Kelsey. I did want to mention a lot of times, you know, we talked about price a little bit earlier. Um, recently, with EANS funds becoming available, depending on your state's interpretation, uh, these funds could possibly use to cover the cost of technology as it relates to uh, COVID impact. Um, and each state is going to be a little bit different, but it's possible. And of course, FACTS has all kinds of resources that we'd be more than happy to help you navigate through that conversation. So Kelsey, I will turn the floor back over to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I love seeing these apps that have been designed and just how unique they are to each school. Um, thank you for that overview, Eldrin, and for the additional information. Um, so now we'll actually use this time for some Q&A from our audience. So you can ask questions using the, the chat feature at the bottom, or it, it should be at the bottom of your screen, depending on how you have it set up. Um, so go ahead and send those in and we will answer them. And actually I do see one that has come through already. Um, okay, so this question, um, they want to improve their social platform. What is the app called and where can I find more information on it and introducing it to my school? So perfect question. Um, it's called Fax Family App. So it's a fax service. Um, we have more information for you to look, uh, to look at this service on our fax website, faxmgt.com. Um, also, you can utilize my information. Uh, feel free to send me an email. The website's located there as well. Um, and I will be sending you some follow-up information after this session as well. Um, but that's a really great start. Just go to the website. It'll tell you a bit more about um, uses. You'll have some FAQs, uh, videos that are available for more um, content looking at the administrative side. So, um, so that is great. Um, and we, we can certainly give you some ideas also on how to introduce this to your school. Um, all right. So I'm just looking at some other questions here. Um, okay, so this one has come in and some of these I'll speak to. And then if I feel that our panelists might have some additional question or Eldrin panelists, feel free to jump in at any time if you, um, if you feel like you have something to add as well. Um, 
This one was asked, do you need to have a graphic designer to help design this app? Um, and the, the response to that would be no. Uh, Colleen had kind of touched on this a little bit ago as well. Um, we have a lot of the tools and resources that are available to you uh, to really help you get this set up and moving along. Um, but obviously, if, if you want to make it your own, if, if you have a design background, you can certainly um, you could certainly do your own thing with images as well. Um, Colleen, did you have anything else that you might want to add to that question? Um, I would definitely say that, you know, it, it offers you from very beginner to much more advanced in graphics um, ability anywhere in their works. Um, and I will say that when I first started the process, I had a million and 10 questions, but the customer service that the email was Un, like you don't get better customer service. And I'm not just saying that I was receiving responses almost instantly. And whoever was helping me was willing to bend over backwards. And they still are. You know, we had parents that were having issues after the last update. Um, and they were just willing to do any and everything to make sure that it was functioning properly. So, and I just also want to point out that it made me really cool with my kids too, because the fact that mommy made something that was available in the app store was pretty fabulous so <laughs> that is pretty great i i love it um yeah i think that's great glad that you're able to utilize support um and and make that work for your school i i love how different they all have come out to be so it's fun um okay another question that i let me read through it here quickly um okay so the school feels that the school would be good or the school feels that the app would be good for their school. Um, how can they gauge preference on how families want to be communicated to or how they could use the app to communicate to their families? Uh, I know we have kind of touched on this a little bit um, in the session. Um, for communication, Jen, would you want to speak to this one? Sure. Um, so that is a good question and I appreciate um, people wanting to know like preferences of their target audiences. So um, maybe trying that annual communication survey uh, would be a wise idea. And also checking the analytics that you have at your disposal for your website and your social media, your click-through rate of your e-newsletter as well, um, so that you're able to understand the preferences and communication um, but really having that data behind you, I think, is, is a wise idea so that you can say, you know, eight out of 10 of our families prefer an app um, for their main form of communication. And then if you need funding or you need to go to your school advisory council, then you, at least you have that information at your disposal. And I think it ties nicely into like a very nice, clean, um, comprehensive communications plan. So as you have that main plan and you're defining all these different strategies um, that are going to help with that, I think mm -hmm. that's a really good way to start gauging the preferences on how people want to work with the school. Yeah, great question. Yeah, thank you so much for that insight. That is very much appreciated. Thank you for responding to that question. Great question. Um, I see another one that's come through. Um, how do you integrate a current grade software like PowerSchool to the Fax Family app? So that's a great question because we've talked a lot um, or we've kind of focused on how it works with our SIS features. Um, but quite honestly, you could pull just about anything into the app um, for easy access. So as long as there is a hyperlink or an RSS feed, uh, you should be able to pull that within the app. And you know, if you have questions on specifics, we could certainly look into that, try to kind of test it out in our environment um, and just make sure that it would work prior to. Uh, but then that would just give your families or your students the ability to access their grades. Um, now, if it does require a login um, for security access or user rights, uh, for whatever that um, that platform or that software might be, then that would still be the case uh, in this situation. They would need to log in in order to access that data. Hopefully that answered your question. Let me know if not. Uh, okay, let me see what others we have here. All right, I have another one here. 
Um, what are best practices and recommendations for rolling out the app to the families? Uh, that's a great question. So at FACTS, we will um, provide you with a launch guide to help with that process. And our support team is really great in kind of, um, you know, keeping you on track and helping you uh, with ideas to make this available to your families. Um, but I know, Nick, you talked about getting your engagement up with your families, especially being a high school. What would you have to add to that question? I think the simple thing here is being consistent with the communication. And, kind of, you know, we, don't, we try to keep in mind all the time with, with how we communicate with families or graduates or anybody, you know, that old notion that it takes, we have to hear things seven times before it sinks in. So we repeat, we, we've been repeating and repeating and repeating, whether it's through our, our, our bi-weekly newsletter, whether it's through the emails that uh, the president and the principal and I send, uh, through social media, we have used social media to encourage families. So we, we try to use the different vehicles, but being consistent in reminding folks that the app is, is out there. Uh, we put in some of our communication, uh, a testimonial from a family about how much they like the app. You know, we, we kind of are, are employing some of the same marketing strategies we employ for enrollment with the rollout of the app. I like that, the testimonial, that's great. Um, thank you for that response. All right, looking at the time right now, um, I think we'll kind of wrap this up. If you guys do have any other questions, feel free to email me. Certainly reach out and help you. Um, but since we are at the top or we're at the end of our time, uh, I do have one thing to note before we wrap up. Um, so as you all know, quick reminder, the NCEA conference is April 6th to 8th. Jonathan had mentioned that as well. And our colleague, Susan Abeline will be presenting as part of the Catholic School Leadership Track on Professional Development for Administrators and Teachers. But again, thank you to NCEA for this opportunity, our wonderful panelists, and of course the audience. Um, thank you again and have a great afternoon. Thanks right, everybody. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thanks for that, Kelsey. And just a reminder, you'll see um, a link to the post-webinar survey in the chat, and you'll see it once the webinar closes. Uh, we encourage you to, to register for NCA 2021 if you haven't already, so it's coming up next week. You'll see a link for that in the chat as well. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us, and have a blessed rest of your day. Take care, everybody. Good being with you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye. everyone. Thank you.